Hello. Um, well, about 13 years ago, around the millennium, I was making exhibits for uh, science centres uh, all over the place, interactive exhibits, um, and I was getting fed up with it. At the same time, I live near the seaside in Suffolk. Um, they started rebuilding our local pier, and I realised I had at the back of my mind a kind of uh, a, a, a latent desire to have my own amusement arcade. So um, <clears throat> I thought I should start by showing you what I do now. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's get this playing. Uh, uh, okay. Good, here we are. <clears throat> so uh, this is my empire, this shed. Um, so all the machines are homemade, mostly by me. Uh, got, don't seem to have any sound here. Uh, this man's got his um, hand in a cage with a mad dog. Uh, this is the bath escape. Uh, this is an underwater adventure. Um, have we got any sound on this video? Uh, there we are. Yeah, just in the background. Um, so this looks as if it goes underwater. It's supported by chains, but it actually just wobbles you around while you watch uh, TV behind a fish tank. This one's fairly self-evident. Um, I actually built surprisingly a long time ago, this one. <clears throat> This is Rent-A-Dog. Uh, you take this fiberglass dog for a walk on a treadmill. And of course, the dog's got its own screen because he's interested in different things from what you're interested in. He's generating some electricity to bring um, a Frankenstein monster to life. Oh, make this, full screen, so this. this is Quick Fit, where she's watching a Jane Fonda exercise video while the bed does the work for her. Um, this is the Chiropodist, this is an early one. Um, you have to take your shoe off and put your foot in a treatment bag where it gets tickled. Um, this is the expressive photo booth that does things to provoke different expressions um, before taking the photos, like, like dropping the seat. I just saw that one. Um, it blows gales of air across the room. Things. This is a three minute package holiday called Micro Break. Uh, he's just getting uh, 30 seconds of suntan from the heat lamp there. And uh, this is Mobility Masterclass. Um, this is training for your future. You have to cross a motorway with the Zimmer frame. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so you can imagine it's, uh, it's satisfying for me uh, going into the arcade and seeing people enjoying themselves, having a nice time. Uh, I'm still just as keen on it now as uh, I was when I started it. Um, it. Going back to one of this morning's themes, it's full of risk. Uh, the peer, peers um, get blown away, they burn down, I could easily get sued, um, all sorts of problems, but it keeps it never boring. Uh, in context of today, I thought I would talk about the process of making a machine, and I find it easiest to talk about what I'm making at the moment. Um, so, uh, I'll just go to, um, yeah, we'll start there, I think. Uh, I'm making a machine called Alien Probe. Um, I'm not particularly interested in aliens. Uh, my ideas come from all sorts of things. Um, but in this case, uh, I work for America, in America for about a month a year, and uh, uh, my friend, second from the left there, Wade, he used to run an arcade, and we're always having discussions about arcade machines, and we've been having these fanciful discussions about alien machines. Um, aliens are much more alive and well in the States than they are over here, and they're particularly a sort of Cold War thing, I think. But, um, so we jokingly thought, well, you ought to have a machine that gives you an anal probe um, and an alien that would give you an anal probe. And anyway, this time I turned up in America and I was supposed to be installing something, but it got lost in shipping and I, and I was very anxious about it, but there's nothing I could do. Um, so I set myself a challenge to see if I could uh, work out how to give people anal probes. And um, I started... There's, America is full of books and references about aliens. Uh, and 
uh, the, the sort of true life stories of people who really do seem to have seen aliens, it always involves being probed in one way or another. Uh, and as you know, aliens come from flying saucers, and flying saucers always have examination rooms where you can get probed. So I knew I was in the right place, and I was researching the right thing. Um, so Wade and I had this idea that uh, you could be probing a little alien in a chamber, um, hadn't quite decided how to make it, uh, which would then get cross and suddenly grow, grow enormous and probe you back. Um, so I don't do much drawing because I, I feel I can only get so far. Uh, one of the troubles in my arcade, it's full of machines so um, uh, already, so I have to make the machines quite small. So I started making a prototype. Um, I was fortunate uh, work at the Exploratorium, a place in San Francisco, has facilities. Um, and this is really just trying to see, and I find it easier to play with bits of wood where I can sit on the machine and think, is that about right, and, and gradually get a shape of it. So um, the Perspex tube in the middle, um, that's where the little alien's going to be. And I found that if you put the controls right at the back, that sort of draws people in. Um, and that bar in the front is where you're intending to sit. So. Once I got that far, I could try it with people of different sizes. Um, so that, that, that little ledge uh, under the seat is for um, people who are smaller, and it actually works for quite small kids. And I also tried it with some really large people. Um, so this stopped, making this stopped me from going mad while I was wondering what had happened to my package. But um, it, I convinced myself that it was a good idea. And so when I got back to England at the beginning of April, um, I started work on it. Uh, of course, I should have said, it's only when you've made a prototype like that uh, that it's really worth starting drawing because uh, the, the old idea that you do the drawings first and then you make something, to me, it doesn't really work. It's a sort of one thing, do a bit of one, do a bit of the other. So in this uh, slide, I'm trying to work, work out where to put the pivot for the main uh, probe, as you can see. So this is what I started working on when I got home. Um, this is uh, that bench seat with the probe in, and uh, here it is with the probe out. <laughs> so I sent it to Wade, and he said, oh, that looks rather vicious. And, um, <laughs> and, and it is. Uh, health and safety, we've t people have talked about this already today, uh, is a constant problem in the arcade. Uh, my basic hope, the basic philosophy of this, uh, for this machine is that is to balance everything carefully and use small compressed air cylinders where I can adjust the speed and the pressure. So really nothing is coming out with uh, too much force and you could easily stop it with your hand. But something of this scale, there is quite a lot of momentum. So uh, I'll only really know when I try it out, get it down the pier and see what, how people behave. So um, the machine gradually gets bigger, adding bits. There's now probes that come out the side of the machine. Um, as well, I thought this would add to it. And there's a flying saucer, of course, up at the top. Um, I think I've got a, a short video of it at, at this, uh, at this um, in this state. Uh, somewhere in here. Yeah, here we are. Um, no. Where's this one? Okay, so this is oh, could you have the volume? And, um, you sit on the stool here and um, peer at the alien down here. Um, and then when the alien grows, um, its eyes will peer over the top and its tentacles come out the sides and uh, more out the bottom. And then finally, um, <coughs> the big tentacle comes round and pokes you at the bottom. So we're about to strip it down and paint it this afternoon. Um, if we go back to the slides now, um, what have I got to? Uh, so uh, this is also while I was waiting in America, I was in thrift shops and going to estate sales and things. So uh, the flying saucer is actually a wok, which was a rather a posh wok that had a glass uh, lid. And uh, the two little stainless steel things either side, chrome things, they're sort of uh, hubcaps off uh, a truck, off an American truck. 
Um, so the machine um, gradually grew, or grew quite fast, really. Uh, and I do draw things, but I'm also all the time playing around with things in the workshop as well. Uh, I had the idea that besides being able to steer the probe, to probe the little alien in different places, you could also adjust the power. Um, there's that 70s, famous 70s psychology experiment where uh, they got students to give other students electric shocks. And I thought if you could sort of persuade people to be nastier and nastier to the little alien, um, but they needed some feedback to know that they were probing harder and harder. So this, what this is, this is a motor with an off-center weight um, attached to a speed control unit. So as you push the lever forward, um, you turn the potentiometer on the speed control and the weight goes around faster. And I thought that should make it vibrate more and more and more. Um, complete failure. Um, and I should have known it, but... Uh, is that you don't think of everything, and it might have worked, uh, but vibrating things have natural resonant frequencies, so at some times it would be vibrating, then you push it a bit further, and even though the motor was going faster, it would vibrate less. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, this also shows how I do my trial and error. Uh, I just tack weld things together. Um, you can see the plates at the bottom are just tack welded to, it's very, very quick. So to knock something like this up would take me less than an hour. Um, this was another attempt with this power lever. Um, this was the idea that when you did finally probe the alien, you could have some sort of recoil, which is the uh, cylinder at the bottom. Um, I went to about five or six different mechanisms before I found one that, that I liked. So the machine gradually grew. Uh, again, a mock-up bits again with chipboard uh, that are going to be solid. Um, this is actually considerably later. Uh, the, the thing has got fairly wired up now, so all the tentacles have LEDs on. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the little chamber. You haven't, can't really see the little alien yet in that one. Um, oh, I think at this point I'll um, show you the next video, which is it's nearly finished in this next video. Um, here we are. Uh, the machine has progressed quite a bit now. Um, we've uh, made the circuit board, that's uh, the panel, that's down here. Um, I probably should just say something about the, the electronics. Um, I use um, industrial computers called programmable logic controllers. That's that grey box in the middle there. Um, they're quite old-fashioned in a way, um, but they're, they're used largely for factory automation. Um, sensors go in the top and uh, digital outputs to relays come out the bottom. Uh, but they're completely unburstable and very predictable. Um, I've only ever had one go wrong. And, and people get cross in an arcade if they put money in the machine and nothing happens. So my machines have to be pretty reliable. Uh, the other thing about these... Uh, um, the electronics, I suppose, is that we live in a world where people do amazing things with software, and, but the physical interfaces are really quite simple. So I don't know whether I'm a dodo or quite what, but I'm unusual anyway, in that I'm the other way around. I start with um, basically something electromechanical and add a bit of digital stuff onto it to, um, to give it some more magic, if you like. Uh, and I think it's a, it, there's enormous potential for this, uh, and I'm surprised I'm the only, seem to be the only person who does it. I always feel this way of making and working and this sort of thing, it's a bit like when silent films um, ended and the talk is begun, is that people have forgotten that people used to make, everything used to be made like this by sort of trial and error and knocking bits on, and now we assume that everything's made by um, computers and, and designed by CAD. It's waiting to be... Uh, bolted in place and connected up. Um, we've got the uh, pneumatic manifold here for all the pneumatic rams. Um, all the rams are in place. Um, we've got uh, a video projector in there um, which is projecting uh, onto the little alien that's in the cabinet. 
So also the um, controls are finished. So there's um, that's the joystick to move the probe around, and that's the strength of the probe. Um, and here's the little alien. I'm going to jump to another video now. This is this is I just shot this video yesterday. Um, it is actually very nearly finished now. Finally, the machine. Um, I hope to get it onto the pier next week. The flying saucer is um, in action. <clears throat> controls on oh, the instructions aren't quite right yet and I just brought there's a little lo oh you'll see it in a second to get to the heart of the alien you need to probe at higher power there should be a laser to show you where you're aiming the probe but I just broke the wire minutes before I shot the video <laughs> to it. This research is essential. <laughs> um, so it sort of uh, carries on in that vein. I have, didn't have time to shoot enough video to show you the whole thing. What I've actually been doing the last couple of days, I found the video was getting a bit monotonous. We shot uh, close-ups of an eye and, and mouths and things, um, but to give more variety, I've tried sort of multiple eyes and multiple um, mouths, which, which I've been having great fun with, actually. This is my favourite one, <laughs> which looks pretty alien to me. So, um, <clears throat> so this, I just added this bit so you can see the final effect of the probes coming out. I don't know if you heard that, but the, um, instead of the little alien growing now, the alien shouts, Mummy, Mummy, help me. And so it's Mummy who's coming out to um, attack you. So um, that's about where alien probes are going. So my background is in uh, theoretical engineering, that's what I did at college, uh, and I enjoy it, it was all hard sums and I enjoyed them, um, I was good at them, uh, but really I can say with complete confidence that those hard sums don't help much in making something like that. Um, so I feel making has a real point in, in design. Uh, this afternoon's thing is about education, um, so I, and I am, you might be surprised, I am interested in education. Um, I suppose it's partly um, my age, I'd like to ha hand on something, and I also like working with kids, I find their energy amazing. Uh, so, um, let me get to some other slides, oh no, I don't need the other slides quite yet. Uh, I, but I find it hard. Um, I, it, it's, it's not easy making things for a start. Uh, I often say that uh, I spent the first half of my life making things badly. Um, and it's not for every kid, you know, some kids take to it. And some kids, though, who aren't academic really flourish with it. So the fact that schools don't have much of that um, is not doing justice to those kids, I think. So it is important. Um, I think from my perspective, I think it works best one-to-one. -one. So I have kids in on Saturdays sometimes to just have a play. And that's a bit like going to a maker's fair, really to sort of try and excite them and think, well, making can be fun. Uh, I had one kid who came every Saturday for several years. Um, and that was more like sort of a more intense sort of education uh, and he did get a lot out of it but it wasn't without its problems um, it doesn't fit well with formal education he asked to, if he if he could do his work experience uh, with me which was a, spend a week with somebody um, in a workplace I think all kids have to do this and I thought 
that if an inspector came to see my workshop, he'd be horrified. But I said, well, we'll give it a try. So this guy came out um, and uh, he said, oh, a real workshop. Um, and I mean, I, I knew that he couldn't let the Gabriel come because uh, I don't have all the right guarding. But apparently he couldn't have come anyway because my uh, workshop had heavy machinery. Um, but then just as he was leaving, he said, um, uh, so uh, you're in this workshop alone with the child, are you? And I was shocked. And, uh, and then he said in a rather sinister way, I'm sure you'll be hearing from me again. And I mean, really, how off-putting can you be if you're trying to help the kid? Anyway, I think the things are best kept separate from uh, the world of formal education. The other thing I learned from uh, Gabriel, uh, I was kind of too easy on him. Um, he was very good when he started, uh, but he got, I should have been stricter, he got too cocky about using all the machines. And, um, and the problem was that then he became careless. And I, he, he wouldn't do any, ever do anything unsafe. He was a careful child in that way. But I used, when he was at his best, I could trust him to help me with my machines. But uh, we gradually got to the state where I was actually letting him do less and less because I didn't trust him to just whiz off and do something. I mean, it's partly he was adolescent. He was more interested in girls and stuff. And, these things maybe have their natural end, but I think another time I would be a bit uh, stricter. Uh, the other thing uh, about education, my other interest, is uh, I go to San Francisco for a month a year and I work at a place called the Exploratorium, which is an art, science, and education research place and an interactive museum. Um, and I'll put on some, get some slides now of that. Uh, yeah, here we are. Oh, that doesn't work. So, um, as a maker, it's fun going to California uh, because make, um, it's the home of Make Magazine. Making is a big thing over there. Um, the maker fairs are absolutely enormous. Um, and extraordinary contraptions. Uh, the bicycle-powered fairground rides are some of my favourites. Um, but there's just all sorts of nonsense. Um, you know, four exhibition, giant exhibition halls, all full of stuff. I haven't really got included enough. And it kind of co-opts all the people who've made amazing things from the Burning Man Festival. There are a lot of rich software engineers who like to make physical things in their spare time. Um, and some of them are a lot of them are quite spectacular. So there's a sort of critical mass. And in downtown um, San Francisco, a year or two ago, this place opened called the Tech Shop, which is a sort of hack space to die for. This is less than a quarter of the full scale. They even got a water cutter, jet cutter, at the back of, of this hall. Um, you, it's like a gym. You subscribe with a monthly thing, and then you book which tool you want to use online. So there's a critical mass of stuff happening over there which makes it exciting, and, and big companies investing in it. Uh, some like Pixar put money in because they're wondering where their next generation of uh, engineers are coming from. And uh, some like Autodesk, I think, because they're worried they're going to get left out if it suddenly becomes more trendy to make things rather than to do things on your computer. Um, oh, that's TechShop again. So this is the place I work. Well, they've actually just moved, the Exploratorium, um, the interactive museums. But the, a lot of visitors come regularly, and they actually uh, come to see what activities are going on. And so my group, the Tinkering Studio, um, visitors seem keen to be invited to come and make things for an hour or so. But of course, this is very different. Um, what can you do in an hour, really? And I. I've, I struggled with this to start with, and I mean, I enjoy this problem solving and helping them what they do. Um, but I think the way I, the, the thing that I get out of it is, is, is there is some point in teaching kids about tools. And we were talking about soldering it. 
earlier, it's because soldering is a bit dangerous, is that it's fun. It's, uh, you know, molten metal, the smoke and all that sort of stuff. It's, uh, kids like soldering. And, and if, if they've done a, an hour of it, they can then tell their friends proudly, yes, I can solder. And, and they might think of some other thing that they draw later on and think, oh, I could maybe solder that. And of course, tools aren't expensive now. They're very cheap, so it, these are things that people can get for themselves. So I, was trying, I tried getting kids now than soldering electronics just to solder bits of jewellery, and um, uh, that's my tiara I'm wearing there. Um, we made this arch, too, so they were decorating the arch with things they'd soldered. Uh, last year we, we, we tried, we bought some of the, the I think that's a big one, but we, we bought some small Makita drills. Um, and, and oh, oh yes, we were trying jigsaws as well. I think jigsaws are good because if the work's clamped and the kid has both hands on top, um, it's quite good for kids really. Uh, so yeah, this was with the battery drills and um, so we, uh, it's a very modest thing, but I found it very satisfying. Um, I got them to drill uh, all the holes first and then put screws into all the holes and what was satisfying was that by the time they reached the end they were so much better at it that you really I really did feel they'd actually learned something even though it's such a short space of time so but of course what I really want to teach people to do is to weld because um, that's how I do my prototyping and it's frustrating that there's so many health and safety restrictions on it uh, in fact, it's the fire restrictions in the Exploratorium. Health and safety in America isn't as bad as it is over here. You might be surprised to know. But they have fire restrictions. So I'm nearly finished, yes. Um, so I'm just going to end. This is uh, my one attempt at teaching people to weld, which was thanks to the Brighton Mini Makers Fair last year. Um, so we did five-minute welding lessons. And... Um, sort of people could come in and they could watch the next person doing it so by the time they got to um got to have their go they were quite good at it and we got a great variety of people wanting to have a go too so there was a queue all afternoon so um i very much recommend it as an activity well I, that's where i am ending great. Sorry. thank you very much that was brilliant thank you